Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us and welcome to the interview and the discussion session of the World Seabird Congress. This session is a part of the World Seabird video project hosted by the World Seabird Union Early Career Scientist Committee. We asked people to, uh, who work on seabirds to show short videos, highlight a place they work and the species they work with and some information on research they do. Along with the video, we are holding a live interview and discussion session like just right now we have. Today, I'm Akiko Shoji, um, member of the Early Career Scientist Committee, and I'll be leading this session. Um, for myself, I've been working on seabirds last 15 years, and today, I'm very excited to introduce Mr. Na Dan Netti, who has spent the whole summer last year at Middleton Island in Alaska, where I think that it's a really special place. Hello, Dan. Are you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Great. So, um, I met Dan last summer at Middleton and we shared a very fun time. So I'm hoping we can find out all the experience he has done at Middleton Island. First of all, could you please introduce yourself briefly? Yeah, so my name is Dan Nutty, um, like Akiko said. I am currently living in central New York in the United States. Um, graduated last year with a bachelor's in environmental biology. Had a great experience to spend on Middleton Island studying seabirds as an intern. Um, and right now I currently work full time um, at an environmental consulting firm here in central New York. Thank you. Um, so Dan, if you could talk about how did you decide working on seabirds at the Middleton Island? And also how did you find out the position? Yeah, so I found out the position from Texas A&M's Wildlife Job Board. Um, really, I kind of applied on a whim, not realizing that it would be something that I would get accepted to. Um, I thought the idea of traveling to Alaska, um, being on an island with a group of people studying seabirds um, and caring for wildlife is would be an incredible experience. And so, you know, I put my application in and so I got it. Um, and it was one of the best experiences of my life. It's an incredible place. You meet incredible people, you do incredible work. Um, and I, yeah, I couldn't be more happy to have had that experience. Um, did you have a flyer experience working on seabirds before? I haven't, no, that was my first time. I have, um, I have prior experience working with snowshoe hare up here in the Adirondacks in central New York, in upstate New York. Um, and that's really the experience I had, but I knew I wanted to expand my horizons and study more wildlife as much as I can, get involved in other avenues. Um, and seabirds was kind of the next option and it uh, definitely didn't disappoint. <laughs> Great. Um, so I'd like to ask about your um, work and daily life at Jamie So to begin with, can you introduce how did you spend the time at Middleton Island for yeah, work that's, Yeah, that's, that's a loaded question. We did so <laughs> much. Um, so the, the average day started with um, 9 a.m. We'd feed the kittiwakes in the tower. Um, and so for those unfamiliar with the, the island, there's a big tower and there's a bunch of windows on it. Um, and we go on the inside um, and they're one-way windows. So the birds nest outside the windows and they can't see us, but we can see them. So we do supplemental feeding. So the supplemental feeding happened at 9 a.m., uh, 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. every day. Um, and so that was kind of sat in stone. We do that every day and uh, along with monitoring of them. And then in between, we have the gaps between not feeding them. Um, and that's when we did our other stuff. Like we'd go out into um, the Glaucus wing gall colony and do productivity checks on them. We do rhinoceros auklet productivity checks on them. And we did stuff with tufted puffins and some stuff with the pelagic cormorants as well. Um, and so the daily tasks were basically you feed, do some monitoring, take attendance of what birds were in what windows each day. Um, and then you go out and do something else outside the tower. You come back to the tower right after lunch, do more feeding, head back out, do more activities and come back in. 
have to defeat ourselves at the end of the day. After that, around seven o'clock, we'd all eat dinner. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I think I lost the connection for a few seconds. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so about the monitoring, what, how, how did you proceed the monitoring for not just the KTOX, but the other species of seabirds? Say that first part again. For the monitoring, like you said, check uh, monitoring research surveys. I think you went to way checks and so on, so on. Yeah, yeah. So for the, for the monitoring was um, pretty similar across the board for most of them. Um, for the rhinoceros auklets and same for the glaucous wing gall colony, as along with the kitty wake chicks, even though they're in different um, areas in different locations, it was always when we, you know, the chicks um, or the, the birds would lay the eggs, we'd measure eggs, we'd record all the egg measurements, um, record what dates they were laid on. And then again, we'd check around and once they hatched, we'd record when they hatched, we'd record how many chicks were there, um, brood size, all of that. Um, and then you'd measure the chicks and we took daily Usually they were every two to four days, depending on what species they were on, or five days. Um, and we took measurements on all the chicks as well. So what was your first reaction meeting the seepers and the chicks? Oh, the first reaction. <laughs> well, when the chicks hatched, that, that was probably one of the most memorable days, um, is finally seeing a chick hatch, which is just remarkable. It's so cool. Mm. So that was amazing. That was just mm. like, everyone was just kind of in awe that, you know, we've been watching these eggs and measuring them. Um, and then you finally see them hatch, which was amazing. The, the birds are incredible in and of themselves. They just, they're, uh, they're amazing. They're just, they're loud um, and they're so much fun. They're so much fun. Great. Um, so the project, monitoring project you have participated, this is a, also a part of a long-term monitoring um, done by ISRC. So can you a little bit talk about long time of monitoring research? Yeah, so the monitoring I think started around in, um, in 1978. Uh, I think that's when the projects really started to take off on the island. Um, and they continued obviously until now. Some of the cool facts I had um, that we just had in our report was that through the supplemental feeding, we found that among 73 fed pairs of the kittiwakes on the Middleton Tower, production was 0.93 fledglings per nest in 2019 whereas 326 unfed pairs produced only 0.35 chicks per nest, um, which really says a lot to you know, what's going on in the oceans. And I think that's a big part of the reason everything happens on Middleton Island and we do what we do there is um, the supplemental feeding really tells us a lot when there's poor conditions in the ocean, um, whether that be the water's warm or colder, um, whether there's not a much, you know, enough food in the, um, in the oceans, there's a big difference in the birds that we feed versus the birds that we unfeed, um, the ones that we don't feed at all. So that's kind of interesting um, to see for long term. You know, we see it over the course of 20 so some odd years, um, which is great data. Mm. What about other species such as rhinoceros oaklets? Yeah, so I had that um, in the 2019 report, they talked about just that the fact that the success has been increasing over the years. Um, mm. We've seen a big increase right now. There's currently about 20,000 individual rhinoceros auklets nesting on the island, which is awesome. Um, the tufted puffins in 1970s, there was only 5,000 and currently there's about 20,000. Um, so what we're doing there is really making a difference and we're seeing big increases in productivity amongst all the species really. Yeah, so really um, breeding success and survival is species dependent even at the same place. At the island. Yeah. Um, so among the all project, can you talk about one project you participated um, and what data you you actually collected? Yeah, so as one of the interns um, and mostly everyone else on the island, we all kind of kind of did all of the, the tasks. Um, we did all of the projects. There were three interns specifically, and I was one of them. Um, and I was in charge of certain data on the glaucous wing galls. Um, and so every two days I was out on the plot, <clears throat> two different plots that we had um, taking data. It was mostly just growth curve mm. data. Um, so I can't really, I don't have you know hard facts on that other than we just took a lot of growth curve data. We'd measure the chicks um, as often as we could. 
denied, um, but we'd measure them as often as we could. And we got a good growth curve on the glaucous wing galls. The kitty wakes we were measuring, um, that's something we all took part on. Um, and that's some of the facts that I just gave were just that, you know, the unfed birds and the fed birds, there's really big difference in productivity and survivorship depending, and it really shows what's out in the oceans. Um, so that was, that was good stuff. Right. Um, so who else, what kind of a, as a project, um, who are there and what project do they work on at the Middle <laughs> last year? Yeah. So, um, so I made myself a cheat sheet cause I knew I wasn't going to remember all these people. <laughs> So I'll go through and list um, just some of the the people off the top of my head. Um, obviously, Scott Hatch um, from Institute for Seabird Research and Conservation. He's doing long-term monitoring in the feeding experiment. You have Kyle Elliott with McGill University. He's doing diving, diving and movement ecology. Morgan Benowitz Frederick. She's with Bucknell University. She's studying psychology and endocrinology of chick development and life history of kittiwakes. Um, Akiko, you uh, you obviously worked with some of the puffins this past summer. Um, I had Sarah Lynn Claire. She's with the National Center for Scientific Research. Um, she's a behavioral ecologist studying mate choice and sexual selection, as well as we had Kristen Gorman and Ann Schaefer. I think this summer was their second year being there. Um, they're from the Prince William Sound Science Center, and they're also working on the tufted puffins, um, putting geolocators on them um, and stuff like that. And that's just to name a few. I'm sure I'm missing. Um, a lot of the PhD students. I know Ethan Hermer studied um, cognition in the kitty wakes. Um, let's see, Naya studied some of the kitty wakes as well. Um, I know Shannon Wellhan and Drew Suave are also there studying um, glaucous wing galls in the kitty wakes. So there's a large list of people um, doing a bunch of different things on the island. So, how do you consider this volunteering opportunity to meet lots of the people? It's, it's absolutely amazing. I would suggest it to anyone who can get, get out to the island. Um, it's a remarkable place. You meet remarkable people. Um, it's just good work and you feel really good about it at the end of the day. Um, you're really making a difference for a lot of people. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I met uh, lots of people, including you, Dan, and uh, it, it was really amazing experience, not just uh, um, meeting and uh, having a nice time, but also we could expand research interest, but also um, gaining ideas and learning from each other. It was really nice experience sure. for me too. Um, but it's often when you have lots of people, <laughs> you can have a difficult time as well. So how did you cope with difficult time at, at remote island? It's not yeah, just the middle of but uh, I, I think all islands, wherever yeah. you go. <laughs> Yeah, that's a tough question, um, especially because most of the time there's really nowhere to go. You'd think you're on an island, so you feel pretty alone, um, but you really can't get alone time mm -hmm. on an island just because there's nowhere else to go. Um, mm -hmm. So we had, you know, we had a one building that we all worked in, but we did have our own separate tents and you could always, we had um, bicycles that we'd ride down one road. And if you really wanted to ride 20 minutes mm -hmm. from everyone else, you could ride down the road and spend some time in solitude at the end of the night mm -hmm. or on your day off. Um, and so those were things that at least I did to help cope with just being with people all the time was either hanging out in my tent sometimes at night by myself, um, reading a book, um, you know, riding the bike down to go do bird watching, stuff like that was, was really crucial. I think in, um, just keeping everyone happy and not getting under each other's skin when you're with each other for three months straight. Mm. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, it's always helps doing other than just work. <laughs> yeah. Um, can you, so today's interview, I'd like to focus on not just on seabed research, but uh, as you gain variable volunteering experience, I'd like to introduce about your daily life as well. Can you talk about um, your life at Midorjong, such as uh, house chores or how did you spend the time? Do your spare time and so on, so on. Yeah, so Middleton Island's um, probably a little better off um, technological wise and more civilized than most islands that people study at. So we did have one building. Um, I mean, we, we didn't have running water and stuff like that, but we did have electricity. Um, we did have spotty Wi Fi here and there. So that was kind of nice. Um, at one end of the island, the FAA, the Federal Aviation. 
nation has, um, and they're pretty well off. So occasionally we'd, um, you know, see cars driving by, which was probably more civilized than most people realize. But a lot of daily chores were just, um, we'd have to go fetch water for drinking. Um, we get different water for washing with, um, cooking was always a challenge just cause you had limited water. Um, so you had to make sure that the water supply that you did have was going to last you not just for cooking with, but also drinking with. Um, and then so people could brush their teeth at night, uh, little things like that, that you wouldn't think about were, uh, were important daily chores that we all kind of kept up on. And one of those ways that we did that was we all had a chore chart. Um, and everyone on the Island kind of split it up and that changed per week. And that's really, I think the best way to deal with, um, Island life is everyone does their part. Um, and you get, you know, you work together to get it done. Um, so that was kind of one of the things we didn't have a bathroom. Um, our bathroom was an outhouse. <laughs> um, our shower was just a standalone shower on the outside and you'd fill up a, a pot with hot water and dump it over yourself in the shower. And, and that works, you know, it, uh, it was, it was completely fine. You get used to it after two weeks. Um, so it's really not a big deal, but the daily chores were just making sure things were kept clean. Um, we all slept in tents, but most days and most nights we were hanging out in the building we had, we call it the Chateau, um, which I found out means castle in French, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it felt like a castle sometimes, you know? So that was one of the things that when you have 12 to 15 people in this little building, um, that's not very big. When I say building, it's, it's pretty small. Um, as you know, Kiko, it's not very large, but when you have 12 people in there, it can get messy pretty quick. So having someone just making sure that their chore each week was to tidy up was important um, to keep things clean and keep things organized. Yeah, that's true. Um, when I was at Minnesota, I remember it, it looks like it was a contest, like cooking contest, <laughs> but, but it had so nice foods and so beautiful dinner. And uh, I got a bit pressure because uh, every night we had something amazing. <laughs> so I didn't have a chance to cook myself, but um, yeah, people really enjoyed uh, cooking itself, but there was a uh, sharing the time and the eating. So yeah. And uh, just to touch on that. So for the people who don't know every night um, after the kitty wakes got fed at six, we'd come in these usually around seven o'clock um, and two people would cook dinner each night and two people would clean. Mm -hmm. And so cooking dinner was you'd cook dinner for everyone. And whether that be 15, 16 people there or just seven of you, um, it was always a fun time, you know, trying to figure out what you're going to make for dinner or you, someone was going to make it the next night and you'd end up using the stuff that they had. And so it was always kind of an adventure figuring out what's going to be for dinner and how can I work with <laughs> the random stuff we have in the freezer or the, uh, the random dry goods we had. And it, it always worked out and we always had a blast with it. Um, and it was, it was a great time. It was a great time to cook. And then we'd all sit at a table together and eat. Um, and many nights, I remember so many conversations that we'd have just sitting around the table, um, mm. sharing memories, sharing random facts about the day, mm. um, sharing bird bites on your hands, just random stuff like that is, is mm. what really brought everyone together. Mm. Yeah, one of my best um, experience at the Middle Return was to bike to washroom. <laughs> this is, yeah. for me, it was the first time and it was really fun. Yeah. If, you, if you people bike, you can tell those people might be going for washroom. Yeah. <laughs> it was really yeah. fun. Um, yeah. Um, so any other things you have done at the Middle Return Island? Like, um, yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about some memories, you know, some of the greatest memories mm -hmm. I had there, um, trying to recall, there were so many great memories, um, little things like we had a, we had a small Olympics with team USA versus team Canada at one point. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that was a lot of fun. We did goofy things like walking on a barrel, um, stuff like that mm -hmm. was so much fun. It brought everyone together. Um, but I think probably the highlight was watching the birds that you've been monitoring for the last two months two and a half months fledge um that's it almost brings you to tears i remember specifically being out on one of the gall plots um it was toward the end of the season and the chicks that i've been you know watch the birds lay the build the nest get build um the birds come and lay the eggs the eggs hatch i measure the chicks you know measuring them for weeks and weeks and weeks and finally watching one of them fly um for the first time was was absolutely amazing that um yeah. i'll never forget that moment and it definitely almost brings you to tears so that's a great memory that i have yeah well i guess well at the middle of john island 
you can gain lots of uh, amazing and uh, memorable experiences um, by watching not just the seabirds, but uh, shorebirds and ducks mm. and terrestrial birds as well. Um, so you already answered to my next question, your best memory, <laughs> but uh, that's okay. Um, so at Middle Region Island, at the very beginning, you mentioned about population um, declining at uh, Kitty Wakes, and we are monitoring, well, at the Middle Region, Scott and ISRC are monitoring play species of rhinoceros orchids. Uh, do you know, can you talk about how play collection data can help us gaining ideas? Like how? which species, how, how, how those data can help us understanding what's going on in marine ecosystem? Yeah, so, um, yeah, and so the oceans are really a big indicator. These birds really tell us so much about what's in the oceans. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really interesting, like I said, so in poor years when, you know, um, it's characterized by a positive PDO, which is just like the temperature change in the oceans, low capelin availability, capelin are um, a type of fish, and poor kittiwake breeding performance, there's a big difference between the fed and the unfed treatment groups. Um, and that really shows, which is, which is a great, a great um, indicator of what we have in the oceans. I know along with the rhinoceros auklets, um, during the nights, once they were chick rearing, which was bringing their bringing food back to their chicks, um, we would go out in the night and uh, try to catch and catch the birds and see what they had in their mouths for fish. And those are great indicators also to tell us what kind of fish they're eating, whether it be sand lance, capelin. Um, and that was another tool that we use. We'd, we'd collect all the fish and then we'd analyze them and see what they were. Um, and that kind of told us what kind of fish are out there and where are these birds foraging at to collect these fish? Right. So you mentioned about um, prey collection of Linus at the Middle Tongue, but I think it's very unique to catch Middle Tongue on trail, uh, mm -hmm. catch orchids at trail. Um, can you a little bit talk about trail, like a lino trail? Yeah, yeah. So the rhinoceros orchids are so cool. Um, and so what they do is they they nest um, and they dig into the ground and they basically form these little burrows where they nest and they lay their eggs and their chicks. Um, and what happens is they're not great flyers. And so what they do is they, all of it's like almost on a cliff. It's kind of like this hill and there's a bunch of salmonberry bushes around, but there's a clearing in the salmonberry bushes and there's numerous of these and we call them the runways. And it's kind of how the birds get their takeoff. And so if you can imagine starting at the top and they start to run and then it gives them a chance to kind of jump without hitting the ground and they just fly off. Um, and it's so cool. And so you'd stay in there at night um, waiting for them to come in and land and they land right in these runways um, or sometimes mm -hmm. on top of the salmonberry bushes. Um, and then they'd fly off with these runways. And it was a really cool experience just to watch these birds come flying in. Um, and they're not great flyers, it seems, because they crash in pretty hard. Um, but it's, it, was, it was a very cool experience to see these birds come crashing in and use these runways to fly off. Mm. Yeah, I think one great thing using a trail to catch auklet is we don't have to disturb auklet in the nest. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, uh, that's really, I found that's very unique, but a uh, very nice way to catch um, and retrieve devices from uh, seekers. Um, yeah. It was, and just so people, the, the way we'd catch them is we'd use nets, um, whether that be something that looked like a fish net or a, a long net that would stretch across the, the trail mm -hmm. so that they flew in, they'd kind of run right into it um, and then we could mm -hmm. grab them. So that was, that was the way we did that. Mm. Right. So we also went to catch tufted puffins and it was a very nice experience, but it was difficult, it's so hard. <laughs> Can you talk about? Yeah, the, the tufted puffins are um, similar in that they dig their burrows into the ground, um, but there's not much cover around. There's no salmonberry bushes, really. Um, so they're a lot hard. They can see you coming. Um, and so one night, well, one early, early morning, um, <laughs> myself and another worker, Abe, went out. Um, 
morning, took these, these birds and we set up a little net around their burrow and then we hid in the bushes and waited for them to fly in. And they're way smarter than you think because they could <laughs> see this very well camouflaged net and most of the time they wouldn't fly into it. So it was quite a challenge to try to retrieve some of these um, geolocators, which are just little bands that we'd put on the birds. Um, mm. So yeah, they're they're tricky. The tufted puffins are definitely tricky birds. Yeah, it was very not very easy one to work with. No. <laughs> um, so at Middleton Island, there is a very valuable long-term research. Um, people may be may, people may be interested in knowing more about long-term research in addition to uh, finding a volunteer position. So maybe can you talk about how people might get those information? Yeah, so there's um, one great resource that was just just started last week, um, was just active, is the new website, middletonisland.org. Everyone should check it out. It's a great website, um, plenty of information about the research that's being done there, the people on the island. Um, you can contact Scott himself and Martha. It's a really great resource to get in. Um, and it was a great, uh, great experience to, to witness happen. Um, the company Torbion is a small uh, web development company. It's actually my brother and sister-in-law um, mm -hmm. and they love to do nonprofit stuff. And so they're at the bottom of the website and you can click on their link and shoot them an email if you're interested. Um, if any other researchers are interested in getting websites out, it's a great resource. Um, it's really important to have websites that are up and running and they're operational and that people can understand because um, it really speaks volumes about what research we're doing and how important it really is because it's it's important stuff and most people just don't have enough information about it. So definitely check out middletonisland.org. Thank you. Um, so one last question. Are you hoping to work on seabirds again? Yeah, so I'm, <laughs> that's a, yeah, I love, I love seabirds. Um, Middleton Island changed my life. I never thought I'd, I'd be studying seabirds the rest of my life, but that's definitely an avenue I'm trying to get into. Um, like I said, I currently just work full time at an environmental consulting firm, but I'm definitely pursuing avenues to further my education, whether it be master's, PhD, and so on, um, in seabird research or wildlife research. Um, but like I said, preferably seabird. Um, so that's that's avenues that I'm actively searching and pursuing right now. Mm -hmm. But we'll see what happens. We'll see how the future, what the future mm -hmm. has. Yeah. So I found one of the great thing about Middleton is very inclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, you have no experience and can still visit Middleton and gain great experience. Um, so mm -hmm. it's really inclusive and everybody is always welcome. Oh, for um, sure. <laughs> so thank you very much, Dan, for um, being here and being available. And is there anything else you want to talk about? before we go? I think that sums it up. It was, uh, it was great talking with you again, Kiko. This was great. I'm glad uh, we got to do this. Great. Thank you very much, Dan. And thank you, Dan, for being here. And thanks, Amanda, who is not being present here, but uh, helping all the technical issues and the problems made this interview happen today. And thanks everyone who might be listening to this interview session. Um, and uh, I'd like to end the session. So one last thing, the World Seabird Union is remaining active online by organizing seabird session discussion forums, the World of Seabird series on YouTube and the World Seabird Twitter conference in May. So please uh, keep check out. So thanks and uh, bye-bye everyone.